Do you believe happiness is only for people too naive to understand how the world really works? Do you sympathize with the writer of Ecclesiastes when he says, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Are you not only unhappy, but proud of it because your more sophisticated understanding of the world makes you better than a happy simpleton? If you have answered yes to any of these questions, you may be experiencing what Bertrand Russell has called Byronic unhappiness. This is the subject of the second chapter of his book, The Conquest of Happiness, and that chapter is the subject for this video. For the love of wisdom, learn to think for yourself. Become a critical thinker who relies on reason and evidence. To give you some context here, uh, Bertrand Russell has divided his book into two sections. The first section is Causes of Unhappiness, and the second section is Causes of Happiness. And we're currently dealing with the causes of unhappiness. Byronic unhappiness is one of those causes, and in the previous chapter, in the, he covered, in general, what makes people unhappy. And I did a video on that previously. You can find a link to it right up here. Let me point right there. And just click on that. And it should open up into a new window. And when that's finished, you can come back here and continue watching this video. So Byronic unhappiness comes from the conviction that unhappiness is the only rational response to life, and it is better to be rational, even if that means being unhappy, than to be happy, but foolish. Russell was certainly in favor of being rational. He co-authored the Principia Mathematica, which was an attempt to use symbolic logic to prove mathematics. He was also an accomplished philosopher. Russell's disagreement with this attitude is that he did not think there is any superior rationality in being unhappy. He maintained, the wise man will be as happy as circumstances permit, and if he finds the contemplation of the universe painful beyond a certain point, he will contemplate something else instead. He also adds that reason lays no embargo on happiness, and those who attribute their unhappiness to their understanding of the world are really unhappy for other reasons, of which they are unaware, and this unhappiness leads them to dwell upon the less agreeable characteristics of the world. He gives three examples of Byronic unhappiness. The first example is Joseph Wood Crutch, who is a contemporary of his. Uh, Crutch wrote a book called The Modern Temper. Another example is the poet Byron. It's from Byron's name that he gets the expression Byronic unhappiness. And his other example is the author of Ecclesiastes, whom he is calling Solomon, although he accepts that the author of Ecclesiastes is not actually Solomon. Now, although he's calling this Byronic unhappiness, he only quotes a couple lines from Byron. And I'm not sure he makes a really compelling case that Byron himself is guilty of Byronic unhappiness, so I'm not going to dwell on Byron here. And I'm going to focus mainly on Crutch and on Solomon. And he quotes gloomy conclusions from all three of these, but it's the quotations from Ecclesiastes that best express what he has in mind. Ecclesiastes says, I praise the dead, which are already dead, more than the living, which are yet alive. Yea, better is he than both they, which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work, that is done under the sun. Now I'm going to add a contemporary example, the YouTuber and Mendham, who promotes the philosophies of ephalism and antinatalism. Both positions echo the sentiments just expressed here by Ecclesiastes. Antinatalism is the position that people should voluntarily stop having children because it is better to never be born than to live. Ecclesiastes has lamented that those not yet born are better off than those who live. Ephalism is the position that the world 
would be a better place if all life, or at least all sentient life, were snuffed out. Ecclesiastes has lamented that the dead are better off than those still living. The author of Ecclesiastes even tells us that wisdom increases sorrow. Russell quotes him as saying, For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge inc increaseth sorrow. The YouTuber in Mindham says much the same thing. Any bliss you get out of life is because you're a, is, is a product of ignorance. Um, any real comfort or any freedom from worry or fear um, is just because you're ignorant. This is a clear expression of what Russell calls Byronic unhappiness. Solomon has also tried to give himself over to pleasure like a fool, but he found even that to be vanity. Russell quotes him as saying, I said in mine heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. Russell distinguishes between the mood that all is vanity and its intellectual expression. Russell says you cannot argue with a mood. He has sometimes himself felt that all is vanity, but this mood would go away through the need to take action. For example, if he had a sick child, he would be focused on restoring the child to health, not on feeling that everything was vanity. He also points out that this attitude is more common among those to whom everything comes too easily. He says, the human animal, like others, is adapted to a certain amount of struggle for life, and when, by means of great wealth, Homo sapiens can gratify all his whims without effort, the mere absence of effort from his life removes an essential ingredient of happiness. The, and he continues, the man who acquires easily things for which he feels only a very moderate desire concludes that the attainment of desire does not bring happiness. And to give an example of something along these same lines, there was a time when the Beatles got together with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the guru who teaches transcendental meditation. And George Harrison is quoted as saying in this context, like, we're the Beatles after all, aren't we? We have all the money you could ever dream of. We have all the fame you could ever wish for. But it isn't love. It isn't health. It isn't peace inside, is it? The thing is, being without some of the things you want is an essential part of happiness because this provides an impetus to action that does not exist when things are within too easy reach. When I was once at a Baptist youth retreat, we were asked what we wanted in heaven. I said challenge. Challenge is an essential ingredient to happiness. Without it, life becomes listless and boring. The challenge in getting what we want is one of the things that makes life rewarding. And it's not just the challenge in getting what we want, but the challenge of solving problems as well. This takes care of addressing the mood. The mood that all is vanity can be done away with by doing something that requires effort, struggle, or challenge. And Russell now turns to intellectual arguments. Ecclesiastes has mentioned that there is no new thing under the sun. Russell mentions that there are now skyscrapers, airplanes, and the broadcast speeches of politicians. And since he wrote this book in 1930, we now have comic books, television, nuclear power, artificial satellites, space travel, personal computers, portable music players, the internet, e-readers, and more. Change may have been slow going in Solomon's time, but it is not anymore. However, Mr. Crutch, who is Russell's contemporary, complains that there are many new things under the sun. Russell replies, if either the absence or the presence of novelty is equally annoying, it would hardly seem that either could be the true cause of despair. The author of Ecclesiastes states that he resents toiling for the man who will come after him. Russell points out that it is not such a bad thing from the heirs' perspective that people leave things to heirs. Indeed, the author of Ecclesiastes was probably someone else's heir, and that made things better for him than if he had to start life from scratch. There is also a degree of self-absorption here if he does not care about leaving anything for his heirs. And if you watched the previous video, you'll remember that I was talking about self-absorption in that video and how that 
can lead to unhappiness. And so there may be an element of self-absorption in Byronic unhappiness. Russell thinks that the author of Ecclesiastes is making the mistake of finding the meaning of the present entirely in the future. Since everything comes to an end, this would imply that nothing has any meaning, that all is vanity. But if the future is to give any meaning to the present, future moments must be meaningful in themselves. And if future moments can be meaningful in themselves, why not present moments? My life is significant right now here in this moment, not just because of what I will do in the future. As for mortality itself, Russell says, if I lived forever, the joys of life would inevitably, in the end, lose their savor. As it is, they remain perennially fresh. So he doesn't take mortality to be a cause of pessimism. And I'll mention here, of course, I don't want to die. Many people don't want to die. And the important thing here is that even though I don't want to die, I don't look forward to the time when I will die, the fact that I will die should not change the fact that right now, while I'm living, my, my life is meaningful and significant, and I can feel happiness right now in my life. Um, the ending of something good does not have to make something bad. Uh, just because something good is finite, so it's my life is finite, does, that, does not mean my life is bad because it is finite. My life can still be good, but eventually come to an end. And now we move on to another argument. Russell quotes Crutch as saying, We have grown used to a godless universe, but we are not yet accustomed to one which is loveless as well. And only when we have so become shall we realize what atheism really means. He seems to understand Crutch to have lost a belief in love. Russell maintains that he does believe in love, and he mentions some of the things he values love for. He values love as a source of delight. He values it because it enhances all the best pleasures. He values love because it is able to break down the hard shell of the ego. And he values love because it is the first and commonest emotion leading to cooperation. And bear in mind, these are just some of the reasons he values love that he could think of while he was writing this chapter. There may be other reasons why he values love. There could be even more important reasons why he values love. And if you can think of other reasons why you value love, uh, please share them down below in the comments. Russell also brings up Crutch's thoughts on tragedy, but we won't dwell on that here. I expect to address ephilism and antinatalism in future videos. What I'll say about them right now is that ephilism and antinatalism both make a big deal about how bad suffering is, but they discount the significance of feeling joy and pleasure which are also parts of life. If you like this video, please let others know about it by favoriting it or sharing it or liking it, which you can do down below. And if you would like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to For the Love of Wisdom, which is my YouTube channel. And let me show you some of the previous videos I've made. Uh, first, we have Chapter 1 of what The Conquest of Happiness. This is the first video in this series. And I will show you a little excerpt from that. Do you ever feel unhappy without really knowing why? You know, there's no major calamity in, in your life at the moment. And your loved ones are around. You may be doing well in your job or at school. And yet somehow... You just don't feel right. And here we have the previous video I made on Byronic Unhappiness. The video that you just watched is part of a rebooted series on the conquest of happiness. Uh, back when I had inferior equipment and a 10 minute time limit on videos, I made a previous video. So. Here's a bit of that. Hello. <clears throat> there is an objection to studying philosophy, which is that gaining wisdom 
can make us jaded, can make us less sensitive to the pleasures in the world. And so, actually more prone to unhappiness, and it won't be all that good for us. We'll just become jaded sophisticates who have a blasé attitude towards the world. It's, it's think of, chil think of say, adults versus children. 